So let's do now laminate analysis. Okay. So what we are going to do now is we are going to build. So let me see if I can. So we are going to build, okay, a laminate. So basically we are going to stack different lamina or plies, uh, each one with a different direction for the fibers. So let's say I do something like this. I have, so considering symmetric lam laminates, so if I put here, so this is the thickness. If I put one, for example, with this 60 degrees, I need to put below another one with 60 degrees. So it is symmetric. So I have two, two plies here. I can decide to make another ply with a different direction. For example, I, I can put in red now. I can decide to put now a ply with, uh, let's say, something like this. Okay, same thing. I can decide to put another one. Right? For example, I can decide to put with fibers in this direction. So you, you are free to keep going and adding more plies and so the laminate is this, uh, all these uh, laminar plies stacked together. Of course, the more plies you add in, the thicker your laminate is going to be, isn't it? Now, if this is my global direction, x, if this is my global coordinate system, x, y, uh, if I impose a strain to the laminate, if I impose a strain in the global coordinate system, right, so that strain is going to be <coughs> Okay, it's going to be, I'm going to impose a strain, it's going to be the same strain for all plies. They will all have the same strain. Imagine I'm, I'm stretching my laminate, right? So all plies will be stretching in the x direction by the same amount. However, because of the different orientations of the plies, the same will not happen for the stresses. So if this is my stresses, I might have something like this. For the green one, I will have stress of this level. For the red one, I might have a stress of this level. Uh, for the one in the center, I might have a stress like this. You see? So this is quite important. So, for example, if you think on the pressure vessel, right, again, you might have several plies, not only one, but when you apply pressure inside of the vessel, uh, you are going to impose a deformation and uh, the walls of the pressure vessel will deform as a whole, right, uh, uniform deformation for all the plies on the laminate. 
But when we do now the stress, when we apply the stiffness and to obtain the stresses, because the plies have different orientations, they will have different levels of stress installed. Yes. No, I just put here different randomly. Oh, I, randomly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, because I, what I want to show is that we impose a uniform strain, but the stresses we obtain they differ from <coughs> ply to ply. I, 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 I didn't. This is a very generic thing, right? I didn't put any. Um, right. So. What we are going to do now is we are going to calculate the overall stiffness uh, of the entire laminate, right? So for the entire laminate here, so if you want, this is the laminate I can write here. We are going to calculate the stiffness of the entire laminate. Uh, so why do we need to do that? Because when I impose uh, a deformation on my laminate, if I know the stiffness of the laminate, I can obtain the stress for the laminate in the global coordinate system. And then if I want to know the stress for each ply, I need just to do a stress transformation to transform the stress from the global to the coordinate system of the ply. Of course, depends on the orientation of each ply. Uh, something you, you, you might find also quite uh, obvious is that the stiffness, so we are going to be looking for the stiffness of the laminate. One thing you, you, you find uh, is common sense is that the more plies you had, uh, in theory, the stiffer uh, the matrix of the stiffener, the stiffer is going to be the laminate. And of course, you will have associated with each ply some thickness, right? So if I say the plies in black are plies number one, you will have a thickness H1, or a, uh, the plies in red will have a thickness, I can call it H2, and the plies in green can have a thickness H3, for example, right? So this, we are going to see this thickness of each ply is going to be a kind of a weighting factor contributing more or less to the overall stiffness of the laminate. Okay. Uh, so. For example, what I'm going to do is, for the stress, stress in the global x direction, um, let me just copy this image and keep this image with us in these different slides so it's easier. Maybe smaller. OK. This is my x, y global axis. <clears throat> so, uh, the global stress, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to integrate along the, the thickness of my laminate. So, the limits are going to be minus h over 2. So this H is the total thickness 
maybe I can put here. So this H is going to be the total thickness of my laminate. So if I integrate this and then divide by H, the total thickness, I'm doing a kind of a weighted average, isn't it? Where the weights are going to be uh, uh, the thickness um, sorry this this axis here is not right this is not y direction this is the thickness direction right so this should be z instead of y right because this is equivalent. For example, if, if I look at the, the red ply, right? So this is going to be my x, y, and then z in the thickness direction, right? Okay, so if I integrate this on the thickness direction and divide by the total thickness, I get what we are going to start calling this our sigma bar. Okay? This bar means is the stress for the entire laminate, not only one ply. Uh, I will do the same for sigma y. Oh, okay. Let me just use the same color scheme. And then I will get sigma bar by y. Uh, and the same thing for the shear stress. Tau x, y, dz. And what I will obtain is of bar x y okay so basically what I'm going to say is if I have for example five plies each ply with 0.2 millimeters thickness for example I will have a total thickness of one millimeter right five times 0.2 so this H is going to be equal to one uh, then what I do is I so integral is a summation, isn't it? I will do a summation of the contribution of all these five plies to my total stresses, right? And I say, okay, that is going to be the stresses of my entire laminate. Let me copy this. So if I do now, if I continue here, the sigma bar, so I have 1 over h, I will still do the integral along the thickness direction. But now I'm going to replace my stress by the stiffness matrix. which. I will say is Q11 bar, Q12 bar, Q13 bar, Q21 bar, Q22 bar. Okay? And this stiffness matrix of the this ply is going to multiply my uh, 
sorry, in fact, what I should have here is not this, is sigma xx, sigma yy, tau xy. Okay? And on the left hand side, I should have sigma sigma bar xx sigma bar yy sigma uh, tau bar xy okay and then this stiffness matrix will multiply my strains okay So, the only thing I did now was, I'm just writing my stresses in the global coordinate system, this one in red, by, uh, I'm writing my stresses from the strains by multiplying the strains with the stiffness, okay? Uh, so. These strains are uniform for the entire laminate. So what can, in fact, what, I, what we can do is we can send the strains outside of the integral because they are the same for each ply. Okay. So I will have my dz here, and now the strains, these ones, they are outside of the integral, just something like this, okay? Because they are uniform. When I integrate over the thickness, that's, that's what I show you here, right? We apply the same strain for the different plies in my laminate. So that's why I can, when I'm doing this integral, that's why I can send the strains outside of the integral. And then I can write I can then say that this is going to be my stiffness of my laminate, A, and that stiffness is equal to one over the thickness of the laminate. I just need to integrate the stiffness matrix of each ply. But there are some good news here. The good news is that for each ply, maybe I can copy this figure. And put it here. The good news is that, for example, if we look at the ply in green this time, for example, between, so when I go from this bottom to the top surface of this ply, there is no change in my stiffness matrix of this laminate, right? Isn't it? That, that matrix Q we defined, basically is this matrix Q that you have here inside the integral. So for one particular ply in your laminate, don't forget we are integrating along the thickness, right? But in that particular ply, 
uh, for the thickness of that ply, the, this stiffness matrix with these Q coefficients does not change. It's constant, right? For that ply. So, if it is constant, I can also send it outside of the integral. And then I can say, I can in fact transform this integral into a summation in the number of plies I have in my laminate. Then I can say, the stresses are going to be equal, one over h, summation, So this n is number of lies in the laminate. Uh, I, I will write like this. The stiffness matrix of each ply, I'm going to put, put like this, Q ply times the thickness of each ply. Okay? And this will then, of course, have to multiply my strain tensor Okay, so this is going to be, this is going to be my stiffness matrix of the laminate. So we already defined this stiffness for each ply before. So we know how to do that for, for each ply. The only thing I have to do basically, look, is multiply that stiffness matrix for each ply with the height or the thickness of the ply. Do that for all plies, and then divide by the total thickness of the laminate. Quite, quite easy to do in an Excel spreadsheet if you want. Uh, you can build the laminate, the stiffness of the laminate, as easy as this. Uh, so let me just see. So. That's pretty much it. Uh, so if you want, we can, well, we can write this is even in a different way. We can move, we can move the thickness inside and say, okay, H I over H. Okay. I can do this, no problem. And you can see that you have this weighting factor, in fact, isn't it? Look, I'm multiplying a stiffness matrix of my ply by this weighting factor, which is what? Is equal to the height or thickness of my ply over the total thickness. Look, if you have only one ply, this hi over h is going to be equal to one, isn't it? So the weight factor is one. If you have two plies in your laminate with the same thickness, both, this for each ply, this is going to be 0 0.5 weighting factor, right? So each, each ply of this two ply laminate will contribute 50% to the stiffness of the entire laminate, right? So, that's it. So, I propose, let's do one example with not many plies, because then it will take too long. Uh, but let me just try to do one example. Uh, okay.
Okay, so the example is this. So I'm going to try to be quick. We don't have too much time, but we can continue in the afternoon. But anyway, let's see where it goes. So we have uh, a laminate with a three ply layup. So three <coughs> ply layup with R equal to 0 0.4. I'm going to, sh to show you, explain you what this is. And theta equal to plus minus 60 degrees. I'm going to explain what this is. <coughs> and then it says here, for a single ply, We have the following properties. Yx, young models in the x direction. Thousand. Newton per square millimeter, which is megapascal, right? In the y direction, the young models is 7,210. So you can see, look at the young models in the transverse direction to the fiber. Much, much lower, right? Then EX. You have the rigidity models at GXY equal to 4,970 Newton millimeter square. And you have equal to 0. Point, oh, what is this? 0. 0.3. Uh, okay. This is the material properties are given to you for a single ply. So we are assuming in our laminate we have three plies with all of them with the same material properties. Okay. And then you are given more data the global stresses, global stresses applied at the laminate you have this, you have sigma bar xx equal to minus 71 Newton per square millimeter. Sigma y, y bar equal to zero. And tau bar x, y equal to zero as well. So our laminate will have only a stress in the x direction. It's a compressive stress because it's negative. Um, Let me squeeze this a bit to see if everything fits in one page. Uh, and then the last set of properties you have is tensile and shear strength. So we still need to talk about this, but I, I can see, I can only talk about this in the afternoon. Um, this is important for the failure criteria basically, for example, it's given these properties Tx is the strength, tensile strength in the x direction of the, of the fibers, so is 1000 megapascal or Newton per square millimeter. The tensile strength in the transverse direction, look at this, is only 40. You see? In the transverse direction to the fibers. So these properties were taken from a supplier of uh, any. 
So these are real properties. I'm not making up these properties. You can see in the transverse direction is 40 megapascal. It can take maximum. In the direction of the fiber is 1,000. Huh? Shear strength is 50. Okay. Right. So these are basically this is the The, the data. So what is the question? Okay, good. the question is, I'm going to put here in red in this corner so you have everything in one slide. Part A. Calculate global global strains in the laminate and the part B which is the strength of the laminate okay so in this example what is given to us is a stress field in the input. The question wants you to get the strain field. So it's the other way around from the previous example. So what we have to build is, let me just get the equation. We have to build the stiffness of the different plies. So let me just get the equation for the stiffness, which is here somewhere. Where is it? So we need to get these equations here for the stiffness. So the stiffness matrix for a particular angle theta, I'm going to write like this, is equal to the transformation matrix transposed times the stiffness matrix of the ply and this at the end we'll need to multiply again by the transformation matrix. So this comes from those three steps I did before the break, remember? So if we are given uh, the strains in the global coordinate system, we need then first to transform 
the streams from the global to the lamina quadrant system. And then we multiply the strains in the lamina coordinate system by the stiffness, this stiffness here, of the ply. And we get the stresses in the lamina coordinate system. And then we need to transform back, that's what we do here, transform back from the lamina to the global coordinate system, right? So these three steps, we can put the, the three steps we derived earlier, <coughs> we can put them in one step by just doing the multiplication of these three matrices. Okay? This C matrix I'm going just to put here. So the transformation matrix is given by, I'm, I already gave you this, but I'm just going to put here so you can at home because we are not going to do these transformations here, we don't have time, but I'm going to give you the final result of this multiplication and you at home can practice. So I'm going to just leave this thing here so you have everything. So this is transformation matrix. Be aware that this is for a particular angle, angle theta. So we can put theta here and theta here. Uh, and of course, C is going to be cosine of theta and S is going to be sine of theta. So in our example, we have three plies, uh, two cross plies, with plus six, one with plus 60 degrees, the other with minus 60 degrees. And we have a ply in the middle with zero degrees. This makes our three plies. So I will take this to explain you what this R equal to 0 0.4 means, okay? So this R equal to 0 0.4, Okay, I did mix up all of these things. But basically, it tells you how many cross plies do you have. Okay, I can put like this R cross plies over the total number of plies, if you want. In the laminate. Okay. So, 0 0.4 means what? Means we have 40% of the plies are cross plies, with an angle different from zero, right? So it means we have 0 0.2 for the plus 60 degrees ply, 0 0.2 for the minus 60 degrees, and 0 0.6 for the zero degrees. So this, oh, this, this slide is getting very busy. So I, I think I shall do it here. So R equal to 0 0.4. 0 0.2 for the plus 60 degrees, 0 0.2 for the minus 60 degrees ply, and 0 0.6 to the zero degrees. The total needs to be equal to one. So these are, so these are my hi over h, right? Remember? I said, okay, we need to multiply the stiffness Q bar for each ply with this. So if we have three plies, we are going to have something like this. We are, I'm going to have to multiply my stiffness for my ply 60 degrees with 0 0.2 is my HI over H. I need to add, because I'm doing a summation, 
Okay, look, I'm doing a summation. I need to add here the contribution from, so this is Q bar, sorry, Q bar. Q bar means a bar is after transformation, right? For the zero degrees, and the H I over H is 0 0.6, plus the stiffness matrix of my minus 60 degrees ply, which has a H I over H of 0 0.2. This is going to be my total stiffness of the laminate. Right. You see, is the major thing we have to do is this calculation of the stiffness of each ply by using this equation here, okay? So I'm going to give you the final result, and then you at home, if you want to practice a bit, uh, you have to do these multiplications here. So what I have here for my stiffness for zero degrees, I have 10 power 6. And I have these coefficients here, 0 0.234, 0 0.00, 234, 0 0.00234, 0.00781, 0.00. Seven. Okay. For the ply at sixty degrees plus sixty, so we have to do all those transformations again. You have the following stiffness: zero point zero two two three seven, zero point zero three nine two six minus 0 0.0, okay. And last one for the minus sixty degrees. So here is going to be minus sixty degrees. We have okay, there is a change here in the signal. So here is positive, positive. Same thing here. Positive, positive, and then everything else is the same, right? Okay. So, oh, we need to finish. All right. So let's finish at this point. We continue in the afternoon from in this example. All right. We continue from this point in the afternoon. All right. See you guys in the afternoon. We can. Continue. Uh, so we ended the, the session in the morning at this point <coughs> for this example. So we built the, the stiffness of each ply. We built the stiffness matrix of each ply by using this equation here. Okay. 
uh, and uh, now we are going to add all this stiffness matrix affected by the corresponding weighting factor which depends on the ratio between the thickness of the ply over the total thickness of the laminate. So if we do that, if we do this, so we have, we calculated in the morning all these stiffnesses we have here. Now I just need to do this very basic equation there to get my total stiffness A of the laminate, which according to my calculations here is something like this. Sorry? Four. This is four. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is the stiffness matrix. If we want to get the compliance matrix, small a, which is equal to the stiffness matrix inverted, you obtain something like this, 10 power minus six. So the compliance allows me, allows me to obtain the stress, the strains from the stresses and the stiffness allows me to obtain the stresses from the strains, right? So if you invert this matrix, you should get something like this. So you can see, do composite analysis in an exam can be a very lengthy process. So that's why you will have composites in your assignment. So you have all time in the world to do all these mat matrices, matrices multiplications and inversions, all of this, you have a lot of time for that at home, right? Right, so this is the stiffness and compliance matrices for the laminate. What we are going to do now is we are going basically to answer the first question, part A, which was calculate the global strains in the laminate. Okay, so I was given the stress field which was minus 71 megapascal, zero, zero. Remember, this was given in the question. Where is it? It's here. Now, if I apply my compliance matrix, which is the one here I'm going to copy. If I multiply this stress by my compliance matrix, <coughs> the result is going to be my strain tensor, which is what I'm looking for. This gives, according to my calculations here, 10 minus six times zero. All right? 
So this is what you get once you build that laminate with three plies, uh, two plies at plus 60, minus 60 degrees, the fiber orientation, the, the other ply zero degrees. We build the stiffness of the entire laminate, we invert it to obtain the compliance matrix, and then we multiply that compliance matrix by uh, the stress, in, given stress tensor, to obtain the deformation tensor of the entire laminate. For part B now, I need to introduce a failure criterion. So I'm going to continue for part B, so I can go like this for part B. Before we solve, let me introduce you the Tsai Hill failure criterion. This is quite, quite critical, quite important. Why? Because so far what we have done was we built the stiffness of the laminate and then we can get the stresses from the strains or we can get the strains from the stresses, right? But the failure criteria now, what is it going to tell me is <coughs> for the applied loading I have in my laminate, it's going to tell me for each ply what is going to be a factor of safety, okay? It's going to give me a factor of safety. And then if that factor of safety is lower than one, it means it will fail, this ply will fail. And then once one ply fails, the entire laminate will fail. If the factor of safety obtained is too high, it means what? It means that ply is not really necessary to be there, right? And this is what really we are looking for in when we design this, on, when we tailor these materials, we want to try to optimize, okay, the design material so it's able to carry the load with a minimum weight. So if we can get rid of some plies because they have a very high factor of safety, basically they will not fail. Basically what I'm saying is that very high uh, factor of safety, is, I'm saying, is not carrying too much load, that ply, right? So we can get rid of that. We will reduce weight and will not compromise on the load carrying capability of the laminate. Yes, you have a question. Is it similar to the safety stuff? So you're doing glass shear with the airbar? Same. Is it goes, if it's over a certain safety, like the one you're doing for the aero one, aero mode glass shear, the safety factor seems to carry uh, No, uh, this safety factor is, is different. It, it, you can see it like, okay, you know the strength, for example, here. In the question, I gave you this information, right? The strength, tensile strength and shear strength of the, the ply, right? Of the lamina. And then what we are going to say, so this is the maximum it can carry, right? In these directions. What we are doing now is we are calculating for the loading you apply in the laminate, we are calculating how much is going to be the installed stress or the applied stress in the ply. And then we are going to compare that installed stress with the maximum stress it can carry, basically. You know what I mean? So, uh, and then we will define a factor of safety from this balance between these two. The maximum it can carry and the stress that is installed in, in that ply. We'll define a factor of safety from there. And then, as the name says, if a very high factor of safety means really, uh, you can start questioning, do we really need to have the ply with this orientation? Because it's not really, it's on the very <coughs> safe side, so it means our, our laminate is not optimized, or I can get rid of this ply, or I can uh, define a different orientation, so what I can do is I can go to the other plies and see which one has the lowest factor of safety, and maybe reinforce that direction with a ply in that direction instead of a ply with a very high factor of safety. But anyway, you, you will see that better once I introduce you the, the Tsai Hill failure criteria. So what Tsai Hill did was, he did something like this. So Tsai Hill is the name of the authors of the model, I will say, this failure criteria model. So they put on the right-hand side 
one. On the left hand side, they start building some fractions. They introduced one which is, okay, the installed shear stress over the shear strength of the material. Okay. They did this and they squared this. So this is a model, right? So if you see, this is a basically a fraction that can, can never be bigger than one, isn't it? Because S X Y is the shear strength, is the maximum you can have. Yeah? So if your installed stress tau X Y is bigger than S X Y, then this ratio is going to be bigger than one, and that cannot happen because it will fail in shear, right? But then they added more contributions. They add now a contribution of this other fraction here, which is the installed sigma y stress over the tensile strength in the y direction, in the transverse direction. And they squared this as well. They add this other contribution. So this contribution is, min is a minus thing. So this is all related with their model. So basically what they did was they built this model by doing a, a best fitting on experimental results, right? So this model is the one that describes the failure uh, more accurately. And this is a model that is used in practice quite a lot. Well, in fact, in Abacus, you can see these failure criteriums there in Abacus, right? So this is the final Sahil. So you don't see any factor of safety here. So what? So the factory safety is going to be built in this following way. So I'm going to multiply both members of this equation by Tx squared. I'm going to do this, so I'm not changing anything. This is poor mathematics. So here on the right hand side, you will have Tx squared. I, I didn't change anything on the Tsaiil criteria, right? The next step is, I'm going to, on the left hand side, I'm going to send Tx squared inside of these fractions that are squared. So I will have uh, sigma x x squared minus sigma x x sigma y y. Um, yeah, and then I will have right, and I will have here. Okay, and then this is going to be equal to dx square. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, sorry, this is not right here, is it? Something like this. Okay. I think this is correct, isn't it? Right, now, next step is I'm going to apply the square root on both sides. So I get rid of the square on the right-hand side. So if I apply square root, I get square root of all of this thing on the left hand side is going to be equal to tx only. Square disappears. Let me just squeeze this a little bit. Otherwise we don't have space. Okay. And now, What I'm going to do is, I'm going to send the square root to the right hand side, and I'm going to say then my factor of safety is going to be equal to tx over the entire square root now I'm going to make it much smaller so this is my factor of safety so, look at this. If what is inside my square root is lower than tx, it means what? It means, so tx is the strength in the x direction. It means my factor of safety is going to be higher than one, isn't it? If what is inside my square root, which Basically, what you have there is the installed stress, sigma xx, sigma yy, and tau xy. If what is there inside square root is uh, bigger than the maximum strength, tx, what is telling me is you will have, you have a factor of safety lower than 1, and then I am in huge trouble, okay, with my composite. So, this is basically the Tsai-Hill criterion. Uh, we are going to see not this week so when we go to computer lab in Abacus when we maybe next week something like that when we have a, a, a lab session on composite materials we are going to see this uh, criterion on in Abacus uh, as well as other because then many many other researchers came with different failure criteria. Uh, but I think this one is a very standard one, is one of the most used filler criteria for composites uh, and it's quite easy to apply so we can apply this now to our previous example let me just find it here where it was, okay it's here so let's keep this factor of safety equation here let me just copy let's continue our Example, our part B. Uh, oops, not this. Okay, let me just keep this here. The corner. Let me get, we need this. This was the, the strains we calculated for the entire laminate in part A. I'm just going to paste here and okay just get the final result okay we calculate this one I can put a signal here this came from part a. Okay, we calculate this in part A of this example. Now, what am I going to do now? Well, I'm going to calculate the stresses. Uh, 
um, for the different plies. And then I'm going to use, okay, starting with the ply at zero degrees. Okay, so let me put like this. For the ply at zero degrees, I'm going to get back my stiffness matrix for that ply, which is this one I have here at the top, right? Stiffness matrix of my ply at zero degrees. I'm going just to paste it here. And then I'm going to say that my stress is sigma xx, sigma yy, tau xy for my ply at zero degrees is going to be the result of multiplying the stiffness of this ply, which is this one. I just paste it there. Okay. Times my deformation, which is this one here, we calculated in part A. Okay, that's it. So this 10 power six cancels out with this 10 minus six. And then the result you get for this ply at zero degrees is, where is it, is here, Minus 115, these units are megapascal, 0 0.04, this is almost zero, and this is zero. Okay? So I can, you can, you can put this zero degrees so we know which ply we are talking about. We need to do the same for the ply at 60 and the ply at minus 60 degrees. Maybe I can copy this whole thing because the strain is going to be the same. Now this is for the ply at 60 degrees plus 60 degrees. So uh, the only thing that is going to change is the stiffness matrix of this ply. So this is going to be for the plus 60 degrees. We need to get that stiffness matrix from yeah this one here in the middle. We calculated before in part A. So you can see these composites, I don't think it's hard. So like I said, it's all about stress transformation, but it's something that takes a lot of multiplications of matrices and inverse of a matrix. So what I recommend if, for you to do at home for your assignment is uh, get this into a, an Excel spreadsheet because you can do all of this in Excel. You can multiply matrices with vectors. You can invert matrices in Excel. You can do all of this in an automated way, okay? So this is the stiffness for the 60 degrees, goes here, perfect. And now this, the result of this multiplication is going to be minus five, minus 12, 1.35. So you can see this 1 to 60 degrees has a very small amount of stress there, right? Uh, the last one we have to do is minus 60 degrees. So let's get this into, okay, let me just, one thing that is missing here. So let me put here plus 60 degrees. Uh, and now, Minus 60, just one more calculation here, 
and we should be fine. Okay, so this is minus 60. Uh, the stiffness matrix is going to be this one here at the bottom. Okay. And this result will be the result of this multiplication will be minus 5, minus, not 12, minus 1.35. This is the minus 60 degrees. Okay. So now that we have the stresses in, on the three plies, I'm going to calculate the factors of safety for each ply. I'm going to use this equation to get the factors of safety. Let's start with ply at zero degrees. We get factor of safety is going to be equal to Okay, Tx, so Tx you, is given in the question. How much was it? Uh, 1,000. So 1,000 here, our Tx. Now square root, Sigma xx square, so sigma xx for zero degrees is 115 minus 115. So because it's squared, I can put here 115 square. Now minus sigma x times sigma y. So careful here, you cannot, we are working with the ply at zero degrees. So sigma y is 0 0.04, sigma x is minus. So this becomes plus now we have tx square so 1000 square sigma y square so times 0 0.04 square over ty square so ty is the tensile strength in the transverse direction is 40. Okay. And the only one that is missing is, so Tx square, so 1000 square, Txy for zero degrees, Txy is zero so this term is zero I think this is 50 square so if you do this calculation you get the factor of safety for this ply which uh, it gives me here 8.7 Okay. Uh, look, basically, look, uh, just, ju just look at this. This is the ply at zero degrees, right? So we have that fiber oriented at zero degrees with x, same direction as x. So I'm saying maximum it can carry Tx is 1000 megapascal. But if you look at this equation, the only term, so you, you will have, for factor of say, you have 1000. 
dividing by basically square root of 115 square so this is going to be 1000 basically dividing by 115 because this term is going to be very very small this term very small because 0 0.04 squared here and then it's also divided by this 40 square i know you have this but this term is zero right so basically for this ply at zero degrees uh, this should be very close to 8.7 so basically, the, yeah, all the, the, it makes sense because the ply, the fibers are oriented at zero degrees with my loading axis, X. So it means this, you can see from the installed stress on this zero degrees, basically all the, the load is on the, on the X direction. Now let's do the factor of safety for the ply at 60 degrees. No, this one is not going to fail because uh, the factor of safety is higher than one, much higher than one, in fact. Uh, there's one, it, I, I would say it's over design. Yeah? Uh, sorry? Sorry, so we're looking for the weakest, the smallest one. Yeah, we have to do this for the other ones. That's what I. What do you mean assume? So if you, like if you can see that this one, the fibers are aligned with the strain. So obviously this one is going to be the strongest one. Yeah, this one is uh, uh, obvious, right? Yeah. But uh, in most of cases it's not obvious. Oh. And uh, if we assume, yeah. that's when things go really wrong in engineering, right? Oh, okay. So it's like just based on direction, we could potentially get, sort of guess which one's going to be the weakest one. Though. Yeah, you can, but you still, have to do all this for all plies. That's why I think, because like I was saying, we have to do a lot of multiplications, metrics, inversions, multiplication. So the best way is to have this done, a template, for example, in Excel or in MATLAB or whatever, done for this. You calculate all of this automatically, and then you, 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 then you, you, you check, okay, this one is a very strong, so you, what if I change this? So you go back, you don't need to do any calculations again because the template will calculate for you everything, right? And then uh, that's, that's the best way of, of doing it. Um, yeah, in this example, it's quite obvious, but I'm, I'm just writing here the, the, the full steps. Um, okay, so let me just... I think I did copy something that was not right. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, this is right for zero degrees. Now for, we were doing for 60 degrees, right? So let's, let me copy this. Oh, I don't need to copy this. So I can just say ply at 60 degrees. Okay, so there is a, So for the ply at 60 degrees, we calculated, so let me copy here, we calculated the stresses at 60 degrees, is this one, let me copy this, maybe I can copy all of this. So these were the stresses for the ply at 60 degrees. So these stresses are in the local lamina coordinate system. Before we move on, we need to transform this to the global coordinate system. The reason why I didn't do that for zero degrees is because it's coincident the two coordinate systems, right? The zero degrees local laminar coordinate system is coincident with the, 
uh, global coordinate system, so you either need to do. But in this case, for 60 degrees, is not. And so we have to transform this thing. Yeah, so. I need to get now my, let's do this way, sigma x bar, x bar, sigma y bar, y bar, tau x bar, y bar. I'm going to multiply this by the transformation matrix, which let me, let me see if I have it here. I didn't want to write it again. Okay, it's here, this one. This is the transformation matrix to transform the stresses. Let me copy there. Okay, so just don't forget that this angle theta in our case is going to be 60 degrees plus 60. And then what I will have then on the here, this will go here. Okay. Uh, well, very quickly, this transformation matrix for this example. It is, so if you replace sine and cosine of 60, you get this. So 0 0.25 here, 0 0.75. 0 0.866, 0 0.75, 0 0.25, minus 0 0.866, minus 0 0.433, 0 0.433, minus 0 0.5. Okay, so if you do this multiplication, now this result will give you minus 0 0.17, minus 4.95, 1.44. Okay. And this is the stress that we need to use for the 60. Let me just copy this. So here, instead of 115, we have 0 0.17 square. Here we have minus 0 0.17 times 495. That is 1,000. Here is going to be 495. Okay. Uh, and here, so this is not zero. This is going to be 144 squared. Okay. According to my calculations here, this should give you something like 787. Okay.
And then homework you do for the minus 60 degrees, but should be also some very high factor of safety. So conclusion is this laminate is really over design, right? So you, there's a lot of improvement you can do there. You probably don't need three plies. Right? Maybe only one at zero degrees. So you you cut the weight by two thirds and only one will do the job. Okay? Most probably. But anyway, this is a academic example just to illustrate. Uh, but what I was saying is that if you get, for example, for, imagine you, you, you've got some, something like this. Um, so factor of safety for 60 degrees equal, okay, 787. Factor of safety, imagine you had apply it at 90 degrees. Imagine it gives you something like this, 0 0.8, right? Imagine you have something like this. So what I will do is, definitely, I need to have something uh, so what I mean is that I don't need to have that much at 60 degrees because my factor of safety is too high and I really need to improve the factor of safety of 90 degrees, right? So I could redesign and uh, use the plies with a different orientation. So that's one thing I might ask you to do in your assignment, okay? Some analysis of the ply. So I ask you to calculate, for example, the factors of safety, calculate the strength, and then redesign the laminate to bring the factors of safety below some specific value to give you some design creativity in your assignment. Yes? So the optimal is like one, you know, like safety is one. The optimal is optimal. Well, you don't want really one, right? You want 1.5, I would say, apply 50% safety, right? But 7.8 or 9 is it's too high, yeah? So there's a, a lot of room for improvement here, okay? Is all right? So composites uh, is this. So uh, the, the book uh, you have in library that is recommended, there's a lot of examples on this. So there are many copies in the library. Just go there, grab the book, and get the examples to practice more, all right? So if you don't have any questions, do you have any more questions? Yes. You can design like this. If you have a very high factor of safety, it means the stress installed in that direction is too low compared with the strength of the, the ply in that direction, right? So it means you don't have uh, high stress installed in that direction. So then you should raise the question, okay, so if, if my stress is very small in that direction, do I really need to have a ply with that direction? You know what I mean? Maybe the other directions with lower factor of safety are more important. Based on the direction of the stress, you can decide the angle. Direction of force or stress that we apply no, we calculated the, these factors of safety for the different plies with different directions, right? Uh, so we are doing this analysis for each ply individually, right? So you get factors of safety for all these plies. So when a factor of safety is very high on that ply, uh, ply it means you... Basically, if you, look, if you look at the equation of the factor of safety, the reason why this is high is because, okay, for a given strength, which is given, depends on the material, right? This can be high only when what you have here in the denominator is low, right? What you have in the denominator is this tall stress in the ply. Yeah, the, the uh, sigma x, x, sigma y, y, tau x, y. So when your denominator is low, it means this tall stress is low 
this for a very high factor of safety, you have a very low installed stress. So if you have a very low st installed stress, you don't need nothing very strong there to carry that very small stress or very small load, isn't it? That's what the factor of safety is telling you. If it is very high, but it basically is telling you, for the strength of the ply, you have a very small installed stress. So you don't need to have a ply in this direction to carry that stress. Basically, that's what he's saying here. If you have a very high factor of safety, right? Of course, if you have a factor of safety of two, I'm not saying that is a very small installed stress, no. But the factor of safety of eight, nine, yeah, definitely, you don't need to. I, I can basically say you almost no, don't need to have that there. Yeah? You just get rid of that. And then you go and check the other plies with low factor of safety. That's where you need to reinforce. You can put more in that direction. Um, yeah? So, what's the process the more you increase the angle, the less it becomes? Is that a solution? Well, it depends on your loading. For this loading, yes, this loading, you had only a loading in the x direction, right? So this one, you add the laminate like this, and you add 71 megapascal like this, right? Yeah, that's, okay, when you add the ply at zero degrees, this one, yeah, this one is the, the one you should have. But yeah, if, if you go then to apply with 90 degrees, this load is going to be in the transverse direction to that ply. Yeah, in that case, yes, but, but if I give you a loading like this, okay, I have, you have this 71 and you have this 100 in the y direction. Then what you said does not apply anymore, right? Because you also need to carry this 100 in this direction. Then the, 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 the ply here in green will be not great for this 100, but the ply in red will be great, right? It's more or less, so you need to practice now, and uh, you, will, you will get more familiar with this, right? So let's do a seven minutes break, because after the break, we are, I will start a new subject. So we come back at 1, 1 p.m., okay?